In this video, we'll be going over something that isn't necessarily an essential part of Linux. However, if you work on a cluster, it's an essential part of your work. And that's the SSH system of connecting to other computers. If you connect to a cluster or really any remote Linux computer, most of the time you will be using the secure shell protocol or SSH for short. SSH in and of itself is only a protocol. The software that you're actually using most of the time is called OpenSSH. OpenSSH is available in all desktop operating systems. It comes from Linux originally. It's integrated in macOS and is basically identical to the Linux version. And in newer versions of Windows 10, since about 2019, a version of the OpenSSH software also comes integrated in the Windows command line or the PowerShell. Since the Windows integration is relatively recent, there are a lot of other tools which are third party, which also allow you to connect via SSH from a Windows system. The most common ones here are PuTTY, which is really old but reliable, and Mobile Xterm, which is more modern and has a bunch of other features in addition to that. Neither PuTTY nor Mobile Xterm use the integrated SSH implementation so they can even run on earlier versions of Windows. The command for opening a connection is simply SSH, then the options, then your, the username which you have on the remote computer, an at sign, and then the host name, or in other words, the name of the computer you are connecting to. Typically, you'll then be asked for the password which fits with your username on the remote computer. There is an alternative to password authentication, and that's public and private key authentication, which I'll go over in a minute. In addition to typing all these options manually every time you connect, you can also specify configurations that are basically presets of various computers and your login details on these computers. If you connect via SSH, by default, all you can access on the remote computer is the console. That's also one of the main reasons why it's so important to learn the console if you're working with clusters. There is a way of opening windows on the remote computer, and we'll see that in a moment. Also, there's nothing stopping you from connecting to the same computer multiple times from different consoles. Like if you open multiple console windows on your own PC, you can simply connect via SSH to the same computer multiple times. That's very practical if something breaks or gets stuck on the remote computer. You can simply open a second console and you then use tools like TOP to see what's going on. Let's go over the presets that you can set in the config file to simplify logging in. Each OpenSSH installation comes with a folder where the SSH configuration information is stored. By default, that's in your home folder. There's a hidden folder called .ssh. In that folder, there is a file named config. It's not always there from the beginning. You can simply create an empty text file called config. You can add or change configurations by simply typing inside the config file. What that config file allows you to do is to specify presets, for example, for different clusters. For each preset, it allows you to specify options like, for example, which username you want to use, various connection information, and other things. There are a lot of different options, and you have to look at the OpenSSH man page and documentation for all of them. Here's my own config file. You notice I'm on my MacBook right now, not on the cluster. And first of all, you can see that the config file can be opened with a text editor. And secondly, there is an entry here. That entry always has the same structure. First, it specifies the host, and then it specifies a shortcut name for the host. Then it specifies the address or the, the name of the computer that you want to connect to, 
and then come all other information. For example, here's the username that I use on our clusters. Here is a different configuration option I won't go into. Here's the X forwarding setting, which we will go over in the next section. This SSH config file is really tolerant as far as indentation is concerned and as far as capitalization is concerned. For example, this could simply be hostname with lowercase. This does not necessarily have to be indented. The syntax is very generous that way. Once you have specified a preset like that, you can then use the preset with the SSH command. You simply type SSH and then the preset name and it will be equivalent to whatever options you specified and whatever user and host name you specified. Simply a shortcut for the full data. I've already mentioned that there's a different method other than username and password for connecting to clusters, and that's to set up a public-private key pair. That's called key-based authentication, and the way it works is that you keep your private key to yourself, and you copy your public key to whichever machine you want to connect to. The advantage for you as a user is that it's really convenient not to having to type your password every time. Also, if you want to connect with a program, for example, let's say you want to copy log files to your local computer from the cluster at regular intervals, and you set up a console script, then it's simpler to do that with key-based authentication rather than doing things like hard coding a password into a script which you're never supposed to do, and uh, other hacks. Key-based authentication is also potentially more secure because it's harder to reverse engineer a private key, considerably harder than just to guess somebody's password. However, key-based authentication is only as secure as your private key and therefore the PC on which it rests. So the rule for you as a user is to treat a private key file like a physical key that you own. So don't give it to people you don't trust and ideally you should never let it out of sight. If you want to set up key-based authentication, here's how to do it. First of all, you generate a key pair. You do that on your PC, not on the cluster. There's a tool for that that comes with OpenSSH that's called SSH Keygen and you simply execute that. The next thing you do is to copy the public key to the cluster. There's a tool for that as well. It comes with OpenSSH. It's called SSH Copy ID. That's not available in the Windows implementation of OpenSSH. On Windows, you have to take the public key as text because that's all it is and copy it manually. We'll see how in a moment. And that's basically it. From that point on, whenever you log into a cluster where your public key is installed, OpenSSH will automatically log in using your key and it will not ask you for a password. Here's how to generate a key for SSH. Like I said already, all you have to do is type SSH keygen. You have to specify a file name for the new key. The standard way is for keys to be placed in your .ssh directory inside your home directory. You have to be careful here. There is a default name for keys. And if you don't specify a different name manually, then it will overwrite an existing key file. And if it overwrites your private key, then that private key will be lost and you won't be able to log in with that key anymore. You also have to enter a passphrase that basically unlocks your private key. You can theoretically leave the passphrase empty. That's absolutely not recommended that will leave the private key unencrypted on your system. It's still more comfortable to use keys with a passphrase rather than retyping your password because you only have to type the passphrase once per open console, basically. Then it's unlocked and then you can log into the cluster multiple times. You'll then be asked to confirm the passphrase, so simply type it again. Here's a demo for that. I'm going to change into my .ssh folder, that's of course not necessary, but it's easier. Then I will run ssh keygen. And it will now ask me for a file name. I 
I'm simply going to specify one. If I was not in my SSH folder, I would have to give a path to the file as well. Since I'm already in my SSH folder, I don't have to do that. Typing now a passphrase, retyping the passphrase. The key has been generated. And inside my .ssh folder, there are now two files. One is the private key with no extension and the public key with a .pub extension. Both of these are simple text files. I can simply open the public key with a text editor. And what you see here is the three different components of the key. First of all, what's important to realize is that this is all one tail line of text. It's simply the editor that introduces the line breaks here. And that line of text consists of three components. First of all, which algorithm was used to generate the key, then a space, then the actual key, and then a comment. The comment uh, is really useful to keep different keys apart. You can edit that comment however you want to. Next, you copy the public key, or as SSH calls it, you copy your identity. The identity in SSH parlance is the key pair of your public and private key. You copy that to the cluster, and you do that by using the SSH copy ID command. The minus I and whatever your ID is, in the, my case it was demo video, and then whichever host you want it to be copied to. Like I said, that SSH minus copy minus ID tool is not available in Windows. Here's what you have to do in Windows. Of course, nothing keeps you from doing this in Linux as well. You take your public key text file that I showed you earlier, and you copy that entire line of text. Then you connect to the cluster with the normal username and password method. You go into the SSH folder on the cluster this time, not on the local PC and you find a file called authorized keys. That's yet another text file. And inside that authorized keys are the, all the keys that can be used to log into the cluster with your user account. There's one key per line, and if you want to copy your key into that, you simply have to do a new line and then copy these three elements into that file and save that text file. If you want to, you can adjust the comment so you know which key is which. It's relatively important to remember which key is which because, for example, if your laptop gets stolen, then you have to delete the key that can be used from that laptop just for security reasons. Once the key is set up, you can simply log in as you would normally with the SSH command. If you have multiple keys and for whatever reason you need to switch between different ones, you can use the minus I option for the SSH command to specify which key you want. You can tell it didn't work if it just asks you for your password because then it did not recognize the key. Here are some tips uh, that make the whole thing more secure. First of all, if you log into the same cluster from multiple PCs, it is recommended to generate a separate key pair on each of these PCs and then copy the public keys from all of them to the cluster. The idea behind that is if a private key ever gets lost or compromised or the laptop gets stolen, then you can simply delete the public key from that and nobody can log in with that key anymore. If you used only one key pair and you copied the private key around between multiple PCs, then you would have to exchange the key pairs on every PC that you own. Additionally, while you can technically leave the passphrase empty, you should not do that. Remember that the password does not have to be entered every time you log in, like a password would be, but rather only once to unlock it. And of course, the general security recommendations still apply. Do not share passwords or keys with anyone and do not leave your computer unlocked.